guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we get the most interesting folks focused on the future and making it more awesome. Today, we've got somebody who's definitely doing that, Sarah Seeger on the program. Sarah, thanks for coming. Nice to be here. So Sarah, you have a really interesting research focus, but I want to dive back before we get into that. When's the first time you remember going outside and looking up in the night sky in wonder? Well, I remember this from when I was about 10 years old. And my father, who is not the type of person to go camping, honestly, he was the type who would wear a tie on weekends. Well, we had a babysitter because he was a single dad on weekends when, when I got to stay with him in summertime. And this babysitter wanted us to all go camping. And the babysitter figured out how to do this. And so we went camping. And it was absolutely phenomenal because I remember stepping out of the tent in the middle of the night. And I, I don't know why I did this. I looked up and it was so clear and I saw so many stars and I just thought, wow. Just wow. It's it's inexplicable how that, that sense of wonder. What is it? What is it about humanity? What is it that makes us <laughs> seek? Um, that is a great question. What are your thoughts? I think we're always looking and striving for more to escape the mundaneness or suffering that a lot of times we find in life. I like that. It gives us something to aspire to. So it, it gives it allows us to idealize in a way. It does. What is space for you? Well, okay. So aside from that idealization, space for me is work, actually. So it is my hobby too, but I actually work with space and space data every day. So, you know, there's a sort of philosophical and the romantic beauty, but then there's just the plain hard work. So let me tell you a bit about that. Right now here at MIT, we run a NASA mission called TESS, Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. And TESS is an all-sky survey it looks at giant strips of the sky, each for one month. And it has already finished looking at the almost all of the Southern Hemisphere. And now it's looking at the Northern Hemisphere night sky. Mm -hmm. And we use computers and people to look at hundreds of thousands to millions of stars looking for planets around those stars. And basically looking for life, looking for specific chemical signatures? Not yet, actually. That's still a bit in the future. Right now, we're just taking, we're just trying to find planets. And maybe some of those planets will be good planets to look for what you just mentioned in the future. And I know you've contributed a ton to this work, both with that work and then the Drake equation. Talk to me in terms of why you got into this and where you see us headed. In general or? In general, in terms of the search for intelligent life. Obviously, you can't predict when it will happen. Right, right. Well, my work is more focused on an intermediate step, but I'll get to that in a second. So... You know, we do have always wondered about life out there. And, you know, there's some great movies like recently, not too long ago, Interstellar. I really liked one called The Arrival. Did you see that movie? Because the aliens... Arrival was good. Yeah. They're not little green humanoids. They're just these so different from anything we might have conceived of. So we really do want to know what is out there. But what I love about space and about my job is we're just taking the first, even though they're baby steps, it's a concrete pathway to finding out what's there. So we're looking for planets and we're looking for planets there around other stars called exoplanets, planets that might be able to support life. That's kind of only where we're at right now. So we don't have you know anything more exciting than that to share. But in the future with new telescopes that are now under construction, we will have the chance to look at the planet atmospheres. And our goal is to look for gases that don't belong, gases that might signal there's life on the planet. And this would kind of be like analogous to after a zombie apocalypse, going to see if there were food things out. You you know people have been there if there's food or something <laughs> something like that. Yeah, that's something like that. Mostly what it would be, though, is we're imagining primitive life might be more common than intelligent life. And that primitive life, that's like if something goes bad in your it's covered with and it smells terrible, like gases are being produced by that life. And so we're hoping that there's just life out there like there is on our planet. That is just using chemistry to live and is generating gases as byproducts. In theory, is it possible that it would be so far removed from us in terms of what life was like that the things we look for aren't actually the things we should be looking for? Well, right now, we I mean, that is a possibility. Like, for example, as humans, we eat food, we breathe air. Our bodies use chemistry, right, to live. Some people wonder if you could have life that doesn't use chemistry but just uses mechanical energy. Like imagine a windmill, if all life was like a windmill, just extracting energy from its environment and using it right away, then our methods that we're using for with 
traditional astronomy tools wouldn't work. Or if we invent AI, AI creates robots and it kills us and decides to explore the, yeah. the galaxy, we won't necessarily know they're there. Exactly. And it's more than that, too. I want to pick up on that thread. It's like if, you know, some people think we're headed for a post-biological intelligence. Like people today, I don't know if that's you. They're glued to their smartphones. You know, if you could go a step further, you're not okay. But if you, you know, put a hard drive in your brain just to remember more or, you know, like there could be this sort of vision that 100 years, 1,000 years from now, we're very different. And yes, if life on another planet had millions of years to evolve, maybe they are, not AI-controlled robots maybe, but a kind of different version of life that we can't recognize. So you're on this mission. What drove you here? What got you to this point in time? Well, some of it was just... One thing that got me here, okay, is I don't know how, but at a very young age, I was able to realize one of the keys to life success and happiness is to find something you love doing that you're also really good at. And I didn't know, I don't know how I got onto that, but I wish everyone could. And it turned out I learned quite young, actually, when I was 16, that one could be an astronomer for a job. And I just was, wow, like I couldn't believe that was even a job. And I remember very clearly when I found out, because to get to my high school, I had to walk for half an hour. I lived in the inner city in Toronto, Canada, and I walked through university campus and I saw a sign for an open house one Saturday. So I went to this open house, went up the elevators to the top floor of the physics building, and I was greeted by these professors and grad students. I didn't even know that was a thing. So I rushed home and told my dad, and he was furious. He told me I couldn't do that. I had to get a job and support myself and not rely on any man. Those were his exact words. And he was kind of right in a way, but he didn't know what astronomers, like parents, if you're a parent or there's parents listening, I realize that now you want your kids to be self-sufficient. You want your kids to go out and get a job and support themselves. But he didn't know what, that, what astronomers did. Could they get a job? Is it even a thing? But I was lucky because I love astronomy and I ended up being good at what was required for it. Not just math and physics skills, but later programming and just sort of bigger picture creative thinking. So that's kind of how I got where I was, but it was a little more practical than that. I got to work at an observatory when I was in college during the summer. I went to grad school right at the time when exoplanets were first discovered. So I jumped on it to work with them. So it's sort of a little bit of luck and timing and strategy. It always yeah. is when you look backwards. I want to, I want to backtrack look a little backwards, bit. Yeah. When you look backwards. Yeah. So your dad, it was both super helpful and also partially harmful, but how do you think about this from a I don't know if you're a parent, but how do you think about this if you were a parent or for other parents out there? How do we help kids going forward? Because we're walking into the future looking backwards. We've only known what we've known. Mm -hmm. It's so true. Like sometimes the dinner table around the conversation around the dinner table at my home where I've got two teenagers, uh, one of them worries about the future. What kind of job should he have? It's not that. So it's not should I be an astronomer, an artist or a musician or a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher? It's what kind of jobs will there be? And that's, I think, the main concern today. And you're at MIT. I mean, students that are there now, the jobs that they're going to have have not even been created or thought it's of yet. It's possible that the people here will create the jobs that the future people will have. Yeah. But what are your thoughts on that? Like, what do you think, you know, like a child today or a teen today, what kind of job would they have? I think their most important job is to find what they, like you said, love and are good at and pursue that because they'll be able to create something out of that. I think if you're trying to build towards the future, it's all, it's, it's easy to skate towards the puck, like Gretzky says, if there's an actual ice rink. But if you're playing in a 10-dimensional ice rink, it's really damn hard to figure out where the puck is going to go. I don't think kids can do it. The education system sure isn't doing it. It isn't. You know what? Did you know that computer programming is not a core course? <laughs> like, I can't believe that I want my kids to take computer programming at school, but they have to do that like as an elective. It's not, it should be core, like English or math or history, because uh, programming, at least the algorithmic thinking is really, it's really everything. Yeah, it's, it's absurd. And yet, it's also absurd that we have all of these separate domains in education. You have math, you have science. They all really need to start merging into merged fields because then a you can accomplish more b it's more interesting and c it's more applicable because you're working between all of these different fields anyways that's true so true yeah i wanna i wanna backtrack a little bit so search for intelligent life 
There's the Drake equation. And then you decided to do something a little bit different. Can you tell me about that? Sure. And by the way, I asked Drake after I'd written the equation, though, because if he minded, if I took his equation <laughs> and he said it was fine, he's good with that. So the Drake equation itself is a collection of terms that helps describe the kind of prob probability is the wrong word because it's not that formal, but you know, the chances, what are the chances that there's some kind of intelligent life out there? And the Drake equation breaks it down into things like, you know, how often are new stars forming? How long will civilizations live? What fraction of those civilizations might use radio tools to send us signals? Well, the reason I took that Drake equation was because we now have a, a kind of parallel search. It's parallel to the search for intelligent life. We're searching for life by way of gases they produce, byproducts, waste products that they produce. And we're hoping that some of those gases fill the exoplanet atmosphere and that we can detect those gases and identify that they might be created by life. So we wouldn't know if like there's intelligent aliens there breathing out some kind of gas or if it's just slime, microbes covering the planet. We don't know which. But I was inspired by the Drake equation to try to help describe in a quantitative way how we're searching for life by way of these so-called biosignature gases. And what do you think about the various probabilities? So there's different variables in terms of if you weigh this up or weigh this down, the chances go way up or way down. Where do you see the most important variables or cutoffs, so to speak? Well, let's just say this. I'll just describe it in a slightly different way is that it's really hard <laughs> overall. You know, stars are so big and bright and massive compared to planets, which are tiny. Like our Earth feels pretty big. You know, if you want to travel to Australia, I've never been to Australia or New Zealand because it's so far, at least from here in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. But our planet really isn't big. It's tiny. You know, our sun is 10 billion times brighter than our Earth. It's much more massive and way bigger. And so the problem is we're just struggling to find planets at all. So to make it really possible for us to find signs of life in the near future, honestly, life has to be very common. We know that planets are common already. We know that planets in the star's so-called habitable zone, the planet that's heated by the star is not too hot, not too cold, but just right for life. We know those are common. So we really have to hope that life can get a foothold pretty much anywhere. I know a lot of futurists have argued that if you're going to go off planet, it makes a lot more sense to design the habitats and not to move on to another planet where you're stuck on a gravity well. What are the chances in your mind that there could be lots of intelligent life around us we're not seeing because it's not residing on planets? Oh, that's interesting. Um, not necessarily around us in like a, hey, we got a no, next door neighbor deal, but yeah. yeah. It makes the search much harder because it's way easier to build something than it is to adapt a world or create a complex thing on top of a world or genetically engineer someone. And then you'd also don't have to worry about the gravity. So it's also a lot cheaper. Well, I don't know. I think it would still be um, I'm not so sure about that. Let me think for a second. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly if life has evolved to just live on habitats and, you know, use energy from the sun or they have a way to capture energy from their environment, we would be very hard pressed to find that life. Oh, I didn't mean that. I meant more like O'Neill cylinders or people build, not people, but civilizations building essentially space habitats. Like you want to know if I think that's possible or what it means? Or... Just in terms of what well, if we're searching for intelligent life, we could be missing the intelligent life by looking for houses when in fact they're floating above the houses and I don't know, tree houses or something. Yes. Well, with traditional astronomy tools, we would miss it entirely for sure. So you talked about the, you talked about the advancement with the, the new telescopes coming online. Tell me a little bit more about what it's like in the field today. I, I, it feels like things are moving. Things are moving. I mean, what it's like in this field. Well, the data science comes to mind. So we do a lot of data science. We have lots of data on stars and planets um, people do a lot of data analysis. Let me think. I mean, there's several pieces to the pie, so to speak, like an investment pie. So we're doing things that are sort of everyday. It sounds kind of interesting, but or t I don't know how this sounds to you, but planet finding is routine. Like with the NASA space mission tests and finding planets, a specific type of planet, it goes in front of the star as seen from Earth. If a planetary system is aligned just so, the planet goes in front of the star and the starlight drops by a tiny, tiny amount. 
And that way of finding planets is actually quite mature now. And the test mission, that's what, what it does. So we have kind of data scientists who are churning away at data taken by this NASA mission, and we're finding planets galore. But on the other hand, as you've asked, well, can we find life or intelligent life? The sort of search for life is a whole other subfield. And in that case, we need much bigger and better telescopes. So there's a sort of slice of the pie about investing in new technology, trying to figure out how to make big space telescopes that are very sophisticated and very stable. And that work also goes on. What do you think about the public-private partnership, what Bezos and Musk have been doing, the whole interest in space and Mars? Well, it's certainly helpful because Musk has managed to bring down the cost for launch and he and others want to bring it down even more. So that ends up helping us in terms of just launch costs. Like the test mission is really funny. <laughs> in the rocket fairing, we launched on a Falcon 9 SpaceX rocket. And we didn't need that level of volume in the fairing. That's just like as if you were um, in a car, let's say you have a truck and all you're doing is carrying like something the size of a cat. And you didn't really need a whole truck just for that, but it was still cheaper. So that's bringing down the cost. I think in terms of getting to Mars and that side of planetary science, I really do believe that it'll be Elon Musk and the private commercial space flight companies that will get the job done. It's just too complicated in NASA and others uh, are just too risk averse to be able to carry out getting humans, getting boots on Mars. Would you go if you weren't going to die on landing or something? Uh, no. No? <laughs> no, I'm more of an armchair traveler. How about you? You're more of an armchair traveler? Armchair. Yeah, armchair traveler means you just read the books and watch the movies. I like traveling, but I'm not going to say I would sign up for Mars. I would say it, if there's been people there for a little bit, I'm, I'm pretty of the opinion if you're testing something out, you don't want to be one of the early ones testing it out. That usually goes wrong. You can make history, but it only really makes sense to make history if history would fall apart without it being made. Someone else will take that spot without a problem. Yeah, I think a lot of people want to. And yes, you really have to want to go on a long journey crammed in a very small space. Where you'll probably die on impact or somewhere along the way. And if not, I, then... feel, I have confidence that landing would be okay because we've landed lots of things on Mars. It's true. It's sometimes hit or miss, but I have confidence landing would be fine. I think just getting there and living essentially in a cave or a bubble the whole time, that would be tough. Also, when you're there, living in essentially a cave or a bubble the whole time would also be tough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of crazy that you see these techno optimists. Yes, let's go to Mars because everything here is terrible and Mars is so great. Mars is like the worst form of hell you could live on at this yeah, point for us. True. Very true. It's interesting. So there's been a lot of advancements now in the satellite space. We talked a little bit about it, the Falcon rocket. There's the nanoscale sats that are going up. How do, how do these impact your work? And how do these impact not just your work, but the entire field? Okay, let me think for a second. I've got to think about that one. So nano, are you talking about nano satellites? Yeah, nano, nano sats, cube sats. Yeah, yeah. I actually have a cube sat. You have one. Interesting. What are you mm -hmm. sensing? Mm -hmm. Well, we are trying to find planets. And, you know, in the planet finding world, there are lots of planets, all kinds. Of, honestly, it's crazy. Any planet you can imagine. How many have we found small. so far? How many have the community we've, has found thousands of planets? And how many, how many Goldilocks ones? Well, that's, we're not 100% sure. There could be, let's say, a few dozen right now. But... The thing is that what really makes the planet surface temperature is the atmosphere. Like, think about it. On our planet Earth, we are worried about climate change, right? Things are getting hotter, more extreme events. And we're worried about parts per million of carbon dioxide change in our atmosphere, right? But imagine a planet with double the carbon dioxide or 100 times or a massive atmosphere that makes a giant greenhouse. So really, we need to learn more about these dozens of planets, we don't really know much about each of them individually. So we couldn't say for sure if any, each one of them are habitable. But in terms of CubeSat, so my goal is to find another Earth, like a true Earth twin orbiting a sun, sun-like star. And these transiting planets that go in front of the star as seen from Earth, honestly, they're very special. They're, they're the only, like, they're different ways to find planets, but so far, the most mature, easiest way is by transiting planets that block out a small part of their stars light. So my ultimate goal would be to have lots of little nano satellites, lots of probably bigger than CubeSat to observe all of the nearby bright sun like stars. Each one 
would be pointing to its own star, essentially, monitoring it for a very long time. Because the bright stars are spread all around the sky. So we can't have a single telescope look at them because they're, you know, one would be like in this direction, one would be in that direction. So the CubeSat up there right now, it's called Asteria. And it was initially developed here at MIT with Draper Lab. And now it is, it was eventually taken over by JPL, a NASA center in California. And they implemented it, built it, launched it and operated it. And it's been orbiting Earth for a couple of years. And the goal of the prototype was to demonstrate that we could reach the, it's kind of technical, we call it photometric precision, but essentially it's how well can you measure the brightness of a star as a function of time. We had to demonstrate we could do that. And to do that, we would have to point the telescope incredibly stably so that like we could met, do this brightness measurement, which I can go into more details if you want. So it's been orbiting Earth now for a couple of years. It's doing a great job. We met all of our goals. Basically, you need to get enough pixels and it needs to be not blurry enough that you can see the changes. That's right. In fact, if you take a light, like imagine if you have a laser or an LED and you shine it at a detector. Imagine you open your phone and the detector in there, it's not quite like the detectors we're using, but similar. If you shine the light and moved it across the pixel, the light that comes back at you would vary by about 40% across the pixel. So the light you shine on it, a different amount comes back to you depending on that pixel structure. And so that's like, that's why we don't want to have jitter. We don't want the thing shaking because as it moves around and those stars move around, you, you'll, you'll see like a lot of noise in your data. Yeah. So I think that we're not totally, sure for astronomy. So for astronomy itself and space science, the problem is that um, we need, we're in sort of an era of precision measurement now. We've done all the easy stuff. And so the small satellites and constellations, except for the example I've given you, there aren't too many things that would be useful. But we do see these small satellites really taking off for like measuring Earth, gathering data on, you know, small scales of what's happening on Earth and things like that. So I think it's here to stay. What's it like working in the industry or working in the field where you kind of have one people looking out and one set of people looking inward. Are there rivalries? Are there weird dynamics? I'm curious. You mean using the same technology to look up versus down? Basically. Yeah. I don't think there's rivalries when we can. As you mentioned earlier, people tend to be very pigeonholed or stovepiped. We try to build off what each other's doing, actually. How do you do that? What's the um, best way? Well, the best way is that here, at least at MIT, we try to go to their each other's talks, listen to what people have to say, and really try to sift through all the ideas to see if any of them are actually relevant. And if they are, we try to collaborate with the other folks. It's often not, though, because, okay, so the problem we have is that in space, things are faint, you know, like really faint, whereas Earth is so incredibly bright. And so oftentimes, the tools and techniques don't intersect. Yeah, it's like the exact opposite of the skill set you need. It's like the exact opposite of, yeah, the technology you'd need in some ways. But for example, the precision pointing that we've developed for this small CubeSat, people could use that for other things like laser communication. We want to send down information with lasers instead of with radio waves because you can pack a lot more information into visible light. That's an application, for example. So there's sometimes crossover technologies. There's a lot of times crossover technologies. Just look at the space race and how much tech came out of that. How do we yeah. how do we change the climate these days in terms of science and space funding? There's really not a lot of focus on it, and people are saying let's pick, fix the problems here. But yet, a lot of times, science and fundamental research is what leads to the innovations that make tomorrow better. It's really true. It's really hard to explain that to people because everyone wants to see a short term gain. We have um, in the department I work in, it's Earth and planetary science, and so for example our advisors want us to focus on carbon sequestration. Like how can we put carbon deep into the rocks and get rid of it from our atmosphere? But it's hard to explain to them that, you know, you need to do long-term research on rocks and the earth. You have to understand something very fundamental um, that would help you with other future applications. So I don't have a good answer to that. We're constantly trying to educate people. And you know, we try to keep lists of things when people ask. Uh, why are you doing this? Why are you spending or wasting money on space? We try to have some answers about some technologies that have been developed and been workful. I mean, people like the medical examples. Like, you know, and astronomy has actually been helpful for developing algorithms and techniques for reading images, which now, like for MRIs and scans of your body, are used as well. So that's one example. You know, the laser that we use in pretty much everything, you know, from the grocery store to surgery, 
that's another example that was just developed. Einstein had the first concept for it just by pure, pure research. So I don't have a great answer, but I, I agree it's a huge problem. Yeah, it's a problem that you see over and over. I mean, I, that's a whole nother can of worms. We'll get into that later, maybe. So you were on the board of Planetary Resources before the company folded. Talk to me about asteroid mining, where we're at now, and when you start to see it becoming feasible and something that goes mainstream. The thing I like about asteroid mining is most, almost all of the elements of asteroid mining we already can do. You know, we know how to find asteroids. We know how to estimate kind of their bulk properties. We know how to get to asteroids. Right now, NASA has a mission called OSIRIS-REx, which is orbiting an asteroid called Bennu. So we went, we know how to go to an asteroid. You know, the Japanese have landed on an asteroid. We know how to do all of that. We know how to get there and do stuff. And we actually know how to bring a sample back. That's what NASA's doing. That's what the Japanese have done and are doing. So we know how to do all those things. The only thing we don't know how to do is drill on an asteroid. We don't want to bring the whole asteroid back. We can't really. We want to be able to sort through the materials on the asteroid and bring back the rare earth elements and other valuables. So we don't know how to do that part yet. So until we can get that part done, we're not going to be seeing um, any returns right away. So there are people who do work on drilling on extraterrestrial bodies. A lot, a lot of it's chicken and the egg, too, because if there was enough commerce in space, you wouldn't need to bring anything back. That, that's right. where, that's no. where the real cash cow is. But how do we how do we kickstart those industries? Do you have any thoughts? I think we need um, the only thought is not very original, but, you know, it's the Elon Musk of the world, the Bezos, the people who have tons of money. If they can invest in the infrastructure, like create the highways, so to speak, then the rest of people can start using it and making other things happen. What happens if they own the highways, but then everyone has to pay like the all encompassing tolls? Yeah, that's a problem. So do you think the do you think it is a purely private play or do you think public should get involved? Governments the governments haven't done a whole heck of a lot, unfortunately. Governments haven't done a lot right now. Yeah, I don't really know the answer to that. Except China. China is kind of going full steam ahead with everything it wants to go full steam ahead with. That's yeah. that's uh, that's another interesting thing. Have you? So you've got a lot of experience in the space. Do you work with a lot of space tech startups, space fo focused VCs? Where do you see the action happening these days? No, my work is pretty focused on planet finding, and that's almost solely limited to government funding because it doesn't have the practical applications that these space companies or VCs are looking for. Makes sense. What are your thoughts? This is going to probably be pure speculation, but the whole object that came into our solar system that looked like a solar sail that kind of skirted around, do you, I, I think you should probably know what I'm talking about. I do, yeah. It's called Uomama. I don't know how to pronounce it properly, but it's an incredible object, honestly. It's just going so fast. It's, it's an interloper from another place. There had been people trying to make a case for it being like a spaceship or some kind of alien spaceship, but it's not. It doesn't have to be. It's just a very, very crazy object. We're lucky to have found it. Can you talk through the reasons that it people thought that and the reasons why they're incorrect? Um, I let me. I don't know if I can do that off the top of my head. I'd like to, but... Not a problem. Yeah. So you're in this field and you said you kind of followed your passion and your skills. What other things are you most passionate about? What technologies or trends most excite you? I mean, just in terms of my work, I just like the small sat revolution is just so amazing because we can send things up and test them more easily. Don't have to do everything on a sort of dinosaur time scale. I don't, I think I have more concerns about the future, really. What, are those, concerns what are those about, concerns? Um, okay. I can tell you what those concerns are. So one is that we're seeing like this comfort and kind of giving up privacy for convenience. You know, it's like you have your phone now and smartphone. I don't know about you, but I've got an Android and it seems to know everything I do in ads for something else. And there's a sort of level of convenience I see with the next generation because they're just used to it. There's people now who've grown up being aware of the world around them. They've had smartphones. So, you know, like the way that everything is connected, the Internet of Things and just this sort of trend towards just a sheer lack of privacy. That really concerns me. Yeah, it's terrifying because people don't seem to mind. And yeah, they don't mind. That's what I'm saying. These generations. So I mentioned that I've got teenagers at home, but this next generation, because they're so used to it, they they think it's fine. You know, they don't. A lot of them don't really. They haven't really known anything else, and it's just convenient for them. They communicate with their friends. Their their life is seamless. You know, they are starting to use um, like debit cards, and you know, the world is just so easy for them. They've never really 
they don't do things like in the hard, hard real world. And easiness is a path to, at least in this case, tyranny and minority report. Do you think we're headed there? Do you think we're what? Headed there, headed towards a minority report type, super authoritarian, super 1984 type <laughs> government. Yeah, that I don't know. I mean, a lot of this info is pretty useless though. Like I think about if someone is monitoring my texts, it's not, it's like my kids asking for something or me like having this ongoing conversation with my husband. So I think a lot of it is just kind of junk, but I guess people, I guess it is definitely concerning about where, where it could be headed. It would be easy to implement that now as opposed to in the past. And it would be easy to understand you completely and then start to move you one direction or the other. It really would. So you see this, you see this now with your kids a little bit. Do you try to limit social media type stuff? What, what's your thought process? Um, so it's less of like, it depends. This is going now to like parental style, but I've always let my, my kids are good kids and I want them to be independent and figure things out for themselves. You know, like, like as a child, a small child, one of them was trying to figure out, he was crawling around trying to go down to this pond. And the question is, you say no and bring him back. Or do you let him figure out his limits? Or when he plays recklessly at the park, do you let him get hurt so he knows the limits? Or do you say no, no, no? And I let them find their own limits, actually. So instead of like limiting, per se, like, oh, you get one hour on this, I try to like make sure they know that we value non-electronic things. You know, like we spend time, um, we went, to, we spend time at our summer cottage where there's just stuff to do. The kids are really into sports. I encourage that because that's, you know, they don't have their phone on when they're playing sports. So it's more about um, adding something than taking away. It's just honestly, it's, I don't know, I'm not an expert. I don't have that many kids, but it's just crazy. Like, it's their world. Like, it's, um, you know, Snapchat and Instagram, and it's fantasy league sports, and it's just like everything. Yeah, in a lot of ways, it's terrifying. And I feel like... It's getting, but it's also getting info, like the their soccer tryouts right now. And like, that's how they get in. So before, you'd see your friends at school and tell them something. And they're sort of the gossip network, right? But now it just happens on the phone. That's their main way of getting information. Yeah, it's it's hard to know what the ramifications will be. Yeah. But one thing I'm glad, though, I, my kids had no electronics till when they were age six and eight. We didn't have a TV. There was nothing at all. Not a phone, nothing. So I think it really does affect the... Yeah, the ramifications of, because as humans for millennia, we ha we didn't have it, right? And now we do. And you see, I'm sure you see children like on the airplane or where have you. On the airplane in the mm -hmm. restaurant, it's like the parents hand them the phone <laughs> yeah. and that's the entire, that's the entirety <laughs> of dinner. But you know, there's no phones during, we try to have traditional like family time and do things together. There's no, no phone in that time. Yeah, I, I was talking to somebody, I can't remember who it was, but he said something to the effect of, imagine you were at a restaurant and you're there with a friend and then suddenly this other guy runs over and starts screaming in your face, answer me, answer me, answer me. That's basically, now imagine that's a phone. We've kind <laughs> of we've kind of socialized that to be acceptable. And it's, at least there's some pushback from this now, but I, I get a little bit worried about some of those same, so those same implications. Do you think, do you think there's a government role? Do you think society is strong enough to fight these kind of things? I think people will figure it out. Okay. You know, there's like people now, ha there's like, um, you know, addiction problems. So I think there are people realizing you can be addicted to video games or addicted to this or addicted to that. I do think people do it. Like at school, they're not allowed phones, you know, whereas in the past, maybe they were. I noticed that Mike, even here at MIT, at the beginning of the year, I tell my class, no phones. Everything, electronics are all off unless you're actually taking notes. If you need to use your phone, like you have that urge that there's something important going on in the background, excuse yourself from class. You can go use your phone outside. I mean, if you don't make that really stern speech and make that very clear from day one and call people out when they're using their phone, they just have their phone. People are just like looking at their phone the whole time. I think it's the same thing with laptops and tablets, even if you're taking notes. Yeah. You just see you just see the stimulation. So we have almost a two year old now and I've gone to the bank and the bank has their little stock ticker up and it's just like complete fascination because the screen is bright and designed to trigger I, I mean the just the brightness of it it doesn't right, matter right. what it is it's true yeah it's a it's a little bit scary so your kids are you kids are approaching the the teen college ages how do you think about that in terms of you teach at mm -hmm. mit we talked about education system being broken and what the future of jobs holds how do you counsel your kids in terms of the future yeah it's a well the college thing itself is a disaster actually you Talk see a lot of kids who are they give up life, actually. 
just to try to get into what they think is their dream college. It's actually a giant mess right now. How do we fix it? It's a bit of a chicken and egg problem because you need colleges to lay off, schools to lay off, parents to lay off these crazy expectations. Like the expectations that kids not only have a perfect 4.0 GPA, but you get a weighted GPA. Because if you take an honors class or an AP class, I only learned this in the last year actually, because I grew up in another country, so I didn't have this. Um, they, you know, then you get a weighted GPA, so you can be way above like 100% effectively, and you have to, you know, it's insane. Like I get kids applying, not applying, emailing me out of the blue to do a summer internship as a high school student and they'll be like a sophomore and they'll have done like, you know, three or four AP classes already or five and they'll have this and that. And you know, you only have to ask them one question. So tell me about something you're interested in. And they usually don't have an answer because they're so busy checking boxes, but the huge mental strain this is placing on all of our young people, at least the ones growing up in privileged areas, it's insane, you know, and you have kids today, Remember what I was telling you about letting the child find their own limits, even if they're two years old? Oh, it's so bad here in the U.S. The thing is that you end up getting these kids who come to university or college, and they've never failed. They never had been dumped by a boyfriend. They've never gotten lost in the city. They've never had any major problem. And then actually, they can't, they can't ha handle it now, and they have a massive mental breakdown. So we've got a huge mental health crisis at the university level. So I only have my own kids at my, you know, disposal, but I let them make mistakes. I let them find things out the hard way. You know, they're not going to be getting into the top elite schools, but it's better if they're like well balanced and they know how to handle a problem because they've had problems they've had to work through on their own. Yeah, you see you see these days, especially in the US, like my wife is Swiss, we've lived in Europe and all over. You see this coddling especially here of we got to protect Johnny from any types of scrapes, but the, the way you get stronger in anything is through yeah. struggle. And if okay. you don't, ha if you don't have that struggle, like I, I, I believe Perret, I believe um Maslow's hierarchy, the, the triangle isn't actually a triangle. I think it's a diamond. You have to have those base level needs met to go up, but that's also to go down. So you're not really mm -hmm. able to get into depression and a lot of these issues that we're seeing crop up unless you have those base level level needs met. Cause you don't have the time and energy to focus on thinking internally. Right, right. I think we need to give all of our kids, whatever age, just free time, free time to do nothing. How do we, that's only, I would argue, half the problem. I would say the other half of the problem is, you, you said layoff. I, I think that was a funny metaphor because I think big part of the, what we need to do is lay off a lot of people from colleges, both kids not going and then getting rid of administrators mm -hmm. because the cost is unworldly. The, the kids are giving up their life before college and then giving right. it up after. They have that's so true. much debt. How do how, how do we change that? I have no idea how we change it. I can hugely agree with you and others on the problem. It's that, you know, fewer, it's really don't know, but it's true. I feel like not, even though I am a professor at MIT, it's not the best environment for undergrads, depending on your personality. I don't think everyone needs to go to college, despite being a college professor. And certain, I read in Forbes magazine recently that there's programmers, computer programmers are being hired like left, right, and center without college degrees. You know, there's some jobs you can go into plumber, electrician. Now it's computer programmer where it's, it's not, you know, we all think we should be more enlightened, more educated, but I don't agree that everybody needs that. I would, so that, I would yeah. say everyone benefits from it, but not necessarily in a traditional college sense. Yeah. It, you can do That's right. Learning should be lifelong and the apprentice type things are definitely making a comeback because they don't have tons of debt. And those are the jobs that will exist after we have more automation. What, uh, what's the most interesting stuff you see happening around you? You're at MIT Center of Innovation. What inspires you? What I love about MIT though, and what inspires me, it's just the whole idea of innovating. It's the idea of being able to take an idea and make it real. And that's what I love about MIT. I mean, there's just so much going on here in so many different disciplines. It's just really, really amazing. I like the robotics actually. <laughs> I know we're, you know, people claim they're worried about robots taking over the world, but I love the robotic humanoids. Um, I like watching the progress there. I love everything to do with space. And so all the new things people are trying to build for satellites, even if they are looking down at Earth and not up in space, I like all that. Um, yeah. Yeah, the Boston dynamic stuff is fascinating. You're, you're really in the hub of it. So you brought, up some of, you brought up some of the cultural issues around the U.S. and the education system. Contrast that with growing up. I, I want to say you said you grew up in Toronto, but contrast the Canadian and the U.S. systems. Pros, well, cons. 
so at least for college, we don't have the Ivy Leagues there. There aren't any private schools, maybe one private college in the whole country. And that one you'd love, actually. It's called Quest. And they integrate all subjects. So you do, you don't, you know, subjects are integrated across disciplines. So it's a very different education there. But anyway, you just have essentially what you call giant state schools. Uh, there are some smaller state schools, though. To apply for college, it, at least when I did it, and it's not too much different now, it's essentially one or two pages. There's only a tiny line, set of lines for in extracurricular activities. There's no standardized testing, no SAT, no ACT. You just, um, it's a grade cutoff, which you might think is not fair, but it's just a grade cutoff. Um, there's a, your taxes are very high in Canada, but as a consequence, education is cheaper. So it's an extremely different system, but you still get a great education there. If you had to pick one country system, not for education, but for everything or the other, would you pick the U.S. or Canada? Well, I've obviously picked the U.S. That's why I'm here. I could go back to Canada at any time, and I may someday. It's a really tough call right now because the world is rapidly changing around us. I don't want to get too much into politics here, but you see all many countries, even Canada and the province of Ontario, their leader. Um, I mean, right wing is sort of different in Canada than it is here, but it's the whole world is changing so rapidly. It's hard to say where the best place is. The one thing the U.S. has that I am very patriotic about is it's this desire and ability to think big and to be big. You know, we don't have Elon Musk, Bill Gates from any other country. It's hard to press to come up with an example of people who have revolutionized areas in tech. And right. it's, because of, it's because of the the way that the U.S. lets you be great. I would agree, although technically Elon's South African. But yes, he, he has very much made himself more or less an American in terms of how he lives. Um, I want to jump to the lightning round. How's that sound? Sure. Eight. Back to the regular interview. What is one thing that I should have asked you about or you would like to talk about that we didn't? I actually think we covered almost everything. Okay. Any bold predictions for SETI? I think SETI will go on forever, basically. Interesting. In terms of never finding something or in terms of even after? Well, there's two things it's with Mars, too. Same with the search for life on Mars, the search for intelligent life sending us a radio signal. I think we'll always be looking. We'll always be searching. That's humanity's nature. In terms of inspirations for you, was there any particular books, movies, etc., that got you excited about this when you were younger? About space, you mean? About space, about searching, about the beyond. There wasn't anything specific. I remember just as a child having a book about the solar system. I think it's really great to try to capture people's imaginations when they're young. I think today's so different because there's so much more in terms of like books or magazines or online things. So it wasn't one thing in particular, but it was still having access to, to books. Sarah, I want to thank you for coming on. It's been fun. I definitely hope you guys are successful in finding more and more planets, especially the, the exciting ones. Uh, what is one thing you would want to leave people with before you tell them where to find you? A quote, a call to action, it can be anything. I want to leave people with this thought that the universe is so vast and there's so many possibilities out there. And I have a saying I really like. It's a little techy, nerdy, but it's, you know, within the laws and physics, within the laws of physics and chemistry, anything is possible. I like it. It's a little nerdy, but it's also a little true. You can do anything, anything can happen. It's kind of the if it can happen, it will type principle. If it can happen, it will, or hopefully you can make it happen. Hopefully you can make it happen. What are you going to make happen? What's your big goal? Finding another earth. So finding another earth and hopefully one with signs of life on it of any kind so that the search can continue for more generations and we'll know that we're not alone in the universe. Goals have to be time sensitive. So when's your goal for? My goal is for my lifetime, <laughs> which hopefully is not too time sensitive. You're, you're at MIT. How long will that be? Well, let's see. I mean, I, I hope to live to be 100, let's say, and I probably have at least 30 more years in my career. So I have time. Okay, I like it. We got at least 70 <laughs> years to not sorry, but we got enough time to make it happen. Now we got to let you go so you can go make it happen. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for coming on. Where can people find you? They can find me on Twitter at, at Prof Sarah Seeger. They can find me on Facebook. They can find me on my website. And if you can find her with a satellite, bonus points. Thanks for coming on today, Sarah. Thanks, Matt. And thanks for tuning in, guys. If you guys have enjoyed this, make sure to say hey to Sarah. Thank her. 
tweet about the episode, share it with a friend. It's the most valuable thing you can do for us so we can try to further science interest in education worldwide to get some more awesome people like Sarah interested in changing the world. So cheers.